Well, today we're going to uh, we're going to focus on the wise men, and we're going to have a portion of the Christmas story read to you. If you'll stand, please, as Jordan reads from Matthew's Gospel, chapter two, verses one to twelve. Jordan. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may too go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the home, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they return to their country by another route. You may be seated. It is the Spirit of God that works in our hearts and lives. It is not the service. It's not putting together a perfect service. It's not a matter of picking music that causes you to tap your feet or, or to get emotional. It's supposed to be the Spirit and the Spirit's work alone that works within us. I remember uh, 30 something years ago, 36 years ago, moving to the city of New Orleans with my two babies and my wife for the purpose of starting a church, a brand new church from scratch, nobody there. And I was eager to do that and we arrived in the month of August and I had till December to witness and to advertise and to try and grow, draw together a congregation of people to help me in the launching of this new church. And prior to that first service, what I did for those four or five months was I would visit all different kinds of churches in New Orleans. And I did. I, I attended Catholic Mass. I attended Episcopal services. I attended the United Methodist churches, Southern Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, I, the whole gamut, I, Lutheran churches. It was a great, great experience for me. And even though I had studied different uh, religions and different denominations, you know, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, and different religions, people often say, what religion are you? Well, you're Christian. Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Confucian, those are different religions, but I would visit different denominations. And I remember sitting in a very, I won't tell you what kind of church, but it was very, very liturgical. Liturgical in the sense that everything was segmented and there was a time to do this, a time to stand, a time to kneel, a time to recite this, a time, you know, you just, you, you're so caught up in the ritual that you seem to forget what's going on, if you even know what's going on. Here's my point. The minister got up to pray just before his homily. And before he gave his homily, he wanted to pray. He did pray. Now here's what you need to know. I remember being this anxious, this nervous, this frightened. It was getting close to December 6th, which was the launching of the new church. And I knew only about four people that were going to participate in this. And 
not only was I nervous, scared about launching this church, my financial stability, I, it was, I, I was struggling financially because they had paid me such a meager amount to start the church that I had to go out and find other income to supplement it. But I remember sitting in that service that morning and since I didn't really understand everything that was going on, I was just totally lost. I, I was just sort of daydreaming and worried. And that pastor began to pray for people who were scared, people who were hurting, people who were discouraged, people who were depressed. And all of a sudden, I sensed the Spirit of God saying to me as that man prayed, can I ever abandon you? I know what's going on. I know your fears, your anxieties. I know your needs. Trust me. And I looked up at that man praying. And I said, thank you, Lord, for using him to touch me this morning. You know, I, I will confront false teaching. And there's a lot of false teaching in the world. But God can even use misled people, misled teachers, those who don't know they're teaching false doctrine. God's Spirit can work in the midst of any place that meets for the purpose of lifting up our Savior. And that includes here. You know, I fully believe that when I stand before God someday, He will say to me, Ken, you got this right, and this right, and this right, and this right, and you were right on here, but you missed it here, and here, and this that you were adamant about, that was, I know. I have never held myself up to be perfect, and I have said, please, please, don't ever put me on a pedestal. We're all going through this journey together. And it's difficult. More difficult at times than others. But you keep the hope, you keep the faith, and you keep on keeping on. All right? During this Advent season, I'm taking a break from my series from the Gospel of John. And soon as Advent is over, I promise you that I will eagerly return there. As you well know, topical sermons cause me great anxiety. I'm not used to doing them. But today I thought I would teach something in this Advent season. Focus on perhaps those wise men that Jordan read about in the Christmas story. Everyone knows some things about those guys. But is what you have learned really true? Have you noticed how acceptable it is in society to bash men? Have you ever paid attention to that? Bashing men. I mean, surely you have. It's very popular, very acceptable. Have you seen this little meme? I thought I would share this little meme with you. I don't know who sent it to me. Love every person because diversity is our strength, except for that man, except for that white man, actually. Uh, male bashing is, is quite common, but perhaps it always has been. You think? Perhaps it always has been. Some time ago I read that if those wise men searching for the baby Jesus had been women, they would have arrived much, much earlier. They would not have arrived months after Jesus' birth because women would have stopped to ask for directions. That's definitely true for me. Kathy used to beg for me to stop and ask for directions, and I insisted that I could find it on my own. 
but I generally wound up stopping anyhow. And that sweet girl would say nothing. I also read that had the wise men been women, they would have called a hotel in advance for reservations so Jesus would not have to have been delivered in a manger located in some kind of primitive structure. Um, I also read that had the wise men been women, they would have brought much more practical gifts than gold, frank, frankincense, and myrrh. And in addition to gifts, I, I'm told that a woman would probably have brought a casserole so the family, uh, you know, would have something to eat. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But on a more serious note, what do we really know? about those wise men who went searching for this little baby on that first Christmas. Now, again, I believe that literally happened. We are, in many theological circles, you're forced to say that didn't literally happen because they start out in Genesis 1 saying that's not literal, and so they have to take it all the way through and so, did this really happen? Yes, it really, really happened. But I'm here to tell you that the truth is that we really don't know very much about those, those wise men. At least we don't know much from the Christmas story, from the scriptures. All we know is what Matthew tells us. And if you notice, Matthew really doesn't tell us much about those Men, where, where did they come from? Matthew's gospel says they came from the east. Well, where in the east? How far east? How, and also, how, how many of them were there, really? We're not told how many there were. Uh, what kind of men were they actually? Again, we do not know that. But things are spoken from the pulpit and we just generally accept everything that comes from the pulpit to be true and we take it and run with it. In the second century, a church father named Tertullian suggested that these men were kings. Not that the Bible says they're kings, but he suggested they were kings because the Old Testament had predicted that kings would worship the Messiah. Uh, that, that could apply to any king that would someday worship the Messiah. I don't think that prophecy was necessarily about these guys. Tertullian also concluded that there were three kings based on the three kinds of gifts that they gave. Frank, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So if three gifts were given, then there must have been three of them. Therefore, our Christmas plays, our nativity scenes, always have three kings or three wise men. But again, the Bible doesn't tell us who they were or even how many came. In the 6th century, someone decided to give them names. Now, surely you know these names are fictional. We know what their names are, but we have for centuries now... Uh, believed it's Melchior from Persia, Baltazar from Arabia, and Gaspar from India. And operas have been written along with plays ascribing these names to those three men, but no one really knows what their names were. We don't even know if they were wise, much less wise men. In the original manuscript of Scripture, what are they called? They're called Magi. And Magi is an ancient Persian word from present day Iran. And it was used to describe a certain group of people who were captivated, it seems, by astrology. By astrology. But they were also known as men that acted very, very strange and dressed rather weird. And that's really, we don't know. The, the, the Latin word, by the way, is magi, from which we get the words magic and magician. 
So why do we call them wise men? I, I don't know. I never, never understood that. Once I studied the meaning of words, but we have concluded that they were very, very wise men. The truth is, we don't know who they were, where they came from, or how many there were. Why doesn't Matthew the Gospel, this is the very beginning of the Messiah's arrival, the search for him. Why doesn't Matthew, one of the things I have questioned ever since I've been a student of Scripture is, God, why didn't you give us more? Why didn't you give us more? Why didn't you give us more information? Why didn't you develop this story a little better? I remember Ben Stein asked the famous atheist Richard Dawkins. You know Richard Dawkins? He's the leading atheist in the world. And Ben Stein said to him, let me ask you a question, Mr. Dawkins. What if you die and you stand before God? What are you going to say to him? After having spent your entire life saying he doesn't exist. And Mr. Dawkins said to him, Sir, I will say, sir, why were you so intent in hiding yourself? That's a pretty good question. I too have asked that question to God. Why didn't you reveal more? Just as a curious person, take this story, for example. Why didn't he tell us more? about these men. But I have to conclude there's a reason. There's a reason. I don't know the reason. There's a reason. Perhaps, just perhaps, we were not given any details about their identity because that wasn't important. Maybe, just maybe, what was so important was their mission. Their mission. Do you remember the main role they played? Did you get it in the story Jordan read? It's shown in these words. Their words, actually. Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east. And there is the key part. We've come to worship Him. That's probably the main point of this story as Matthew tells it to us. We have come to worship. And as we look at what Matthew tells us about these men, although they may have been strange little men who I'm told dressed kind of weird, they really were wise men, I guess. You know, given the choice between being intelligent and being wise, we should all choose wise every time. Wisdom. Wisdom is defined as applying how you apply that which you know, no matter how much you know. Whatever you know, how you apply it is your wisdom. What level of wisdom do you have? It's not a matter of how much you know, but how you apply in your living what it is that you do know. For example, I as a pastor am so frustrated with with what I watch in the church world. In case you have missed it, Christianity today has turned to entertainment. It's about entertainment. Hillsong Church is probably the most popular now in the world, and they're all about entertainment. It's entertainment. Who can put on the best show in town? who can manipulate the best in town, who can draw the biggest crowds. 
and the competition begins to be the biggest church. So why did you come here? Why did you come to this little church now because of the pandemic that is smaller than ever before when there are so many more, much bigger churches with much better preachers and, you know, why did you come? Did you come to worship? Did you come to worship? Is that your focus? I think the wise men, their focus was the star, but the star wasn't the end. The star was leading them to where their mind was focused on worshiping Him. It is so easy to be distracted. You look around to see what maybe others are wearing, what others look like, if they're having a bad hair day. Many love this time of the year and they go to see the Christmas decorations. We like to look at the banners here, the music. Perhaps you've come simply because on Sunday mornings you've always attended church services. How dare you not attend church? But were you like I was in that liturgical church, just kind of listening and not participating until the Spirit of God actually spoke to me? Have you been singing to the Lord this morning? Or perhaps just singing, just reading the words. Have you been praying or just listening to Jordan pray or myself pray? I want you to consider three things, perhaps, about those wise men that we can think about. The wise men of today and the wise women of today, they still seek the Lord. They do still seek this God of ours. They seek to serve Him, to worship Him. Wise men still seek Him, that's for sure. It's likely that these magi were descendants of the ten tribes of Israel that remained in Babylon after the time of Daniel. Most theologians agree that's probably where these wise men came from. You see, many of the Jews after the captivity did not return to Jerusalem. They did not return to the synagogue. They didn't go back to their homeland. They rather chose to stay in Babylon, which was a pagan country. These magi most likely were men who stayed in Babylon. And they were in all probability, they had assimilated into the culture. They had probably adopted many of the religious practices of the pagans. Hence, that was their interest in astrology. So these magi were not necessarily orthodox in their faith. Probably weren't orthodox in their faith. They didn't have it all together. Theologically, being Magi, they probably were not even considered true worshipers. And that's why it's always dangerous for us to play, to judge people. It is always dangerous for us to judge people. To say, you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian because this is what I've seen you do or say or heard you say. You know, Don't, don't play those games because I don't really know what is in your heart or your heart. I don't know what is there. And it's God who looks where? At the heart. And where does man look? He just looks at the outward appearance. But because of all they can see, actually, he cannot see into the heart. So these wise men, it would be easy to pass judgment on them. They were probably not considered true worshipers by the Jews. But they did come seeking. They, they came seeking. You know, I recognized many, many years ago as a pastor that most people don't have it all together. 
Most don't know the scriptures very well, to tell you the truth. Most people in every church do not know the scriptures very well. You may be one of those. Frankly, you might be struggling in many areas of your life. But you did come this morning. And you know what that tells me? It tells me this much about you. If it tells me nothing else about you, you are seeking the Lord. You're seeking the Lord. And this, this is good. We don't know exactly how far they traveled, but it's likely that they came from a long, long way off. Babylon, in Persia, ancient Persia. So they would have traveled a long, long way to get to Bethlehem. Now imagine traveling a long, long hundreds, if not thousands of miles. It would be more, it would be hundreds of miles. On a camel. Have you ever ridden a camel? I rode a one hump camel <laughs> when I went to Israel. I've been there a couple of times, and on one of my visits, I thought, you know, there's an opportunity for me to ride, but ride a camel. I, I think I'll ride that camel. But, you know, there are one hump camels or two hump camels. I would have preferred the two hump to get down in between the humps. I thought it would be easier, but anyhow, I didn't want to stay on the camel very long. It wasn't comfortable and it was it was kind of spooky, but what was that said, look, Fran, I'm scared of horses, so you know. But anyhow, they rode these camels a long way to get there. Contrast them with the chief priests, the chief teachers of the law. Right in Jerusalem, only six miles from Bethlehem. We're not told they went seeking. They didn't need to seek. They had it all together. Now here's something else you need to know. Matthew was writing this gospel to the Jewish people in order to convince them that Jesus was the Christ the long-awaited Messiah predicted in the Old Testament. That's why he made so many references to it. And what he was saying to these people to whom he was writing was that they should be like the Magi. And by the way, the Jews would have been looking down upon, they should be like the Magi, not like the Jewish religious leaders. Wise men seek him. They weren't seeking him because they, the Jews, they thought they had him already. Had it all together. And not, even though you might not have it all together, it's good, it is wise that you're seeking him. But you know what? The really wise don't just seek him. They find him. They find him. Every once in a while, I, 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 go, I look at Facebook Look, go to the, our, our uh, web page and Jordan has posted this ugly picture of me making this face where I'm saying <laughs> where I want you to change that picture no, no. where I say we don't find Jesus he's not the one lost I mean he, am I getting that right? <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't find Jesus. He's not the one lost. We're the ones that are lost. He wants, he wants us to, to seek Him so He can save us. But He can't save us unless we seek Him. But uh, the Magi, stopped in Jerusalem to find out exactly where they could find him. Remember that part? They're looking for him. So they thought they'd stop and ask directions. They did stop and ask directions, ladies. And there they met a guy by the name of Herod, King Herod. Now, Herod wasn't very happy with their question. They asked him, where is he who is born King of the Jews? Because we've seen his star in the east. And we've come to worship him. Well, Herod was the king. So 
what are you talking about? Who is this new baby claiming my title? So King Herod said, well, listen, I'm going to send you on your way. I want you to find him. And when you find him, let me know so I can go worship him as well. Well, they went searching for him. And in that continual search, that was, a, that was an act of service. Wise men still serve him. Are, are you serving him? You know something? Most people whose lives are a mess, a total disaster. And we see them all around us. Many in prison. Many's lives shattered. Because they didn't seek, they never served, they surely never worshipped Him. What they sought and served and worshipped was self, what they wanted. And so they're still destroying their lives. You know, the truly wise don't just see and serve, but they do worship. These men had come all this way with that one purpose in mind. And that, that purpose was to worship the one who was born king of the Jews. They came to worship the Son of God. And they brought him expensive gifts. Oh, they did. Gifts fit for a king. You know, the church does a lot of things. The, the church has a lot of activities. It doesn't this day. These days, not ours. But members expect a lot from the church. But the main purpose for the church is to gather to worship. That's its number one responsibility. Its one, number one purpose is to gather to worship Him. We are not the audience. There's to be an audience of one. Remember that? An audience of one. That is Jesus. From the moment the service, this service starts, the focus, from the moment it starts to the moment it ends, the focus is Him. The invocation is about asking for Him to be with us. All the singing is to or about Him. Our praying is to Him. Our communion is to remind us of Him. The sermon is about Him. The benediction is about Him going with us as we leave. To repeat that line, it's not about us. It's not about us. Theologian J.C. Ryle, perhaps you've heard of him, said the, this concerning these wise men. He said, we read of no greater faith than this in all of the Bible. It's a faith that deserves to be placed side by side with that of the penitent thief, the one hanging on the cross. He says, the wise men saw a newborn babe on a lap of a poor woman, and yet they worshipped him and confessed him to be the Christ. Imagine the faith that must have taken. Now really, consider what they did. Consider the faith they must have had. They went searching because of an Old Testament prophecy about a Jewish king that would be born in the city of Bethlehem who would be the Messiah. They had put the scriptures together and they had concluded that this star was leading to that Messiah. Those magi really were wise men, but they weren't wise because of the knowledge they had of astrology or anything else. They were wise because they were intent on seeking, seeking after Him. This is what life is supposed to be about. With all the other stuff thrown in, the, the thing that life is about, I say this to myself, I say this to all of us, it's about seeking Him. And then when He finds us, because we have sought Him, it's about worshiping Him. Today, despite the culture, despite science, despite the trappings of the world, there are still wise people who seek Him. I was reading this week, C.S. Lewis, as certainly you have heard, he was an Einstein of his day, but a man of faith. And I love to read his stuff. Uh, 
but he's he's so wise. It's, it's kind of like I introduced you back six months ago to Jordan Peterson, a, a guy who is just so brilliant. I read his book, uh, his book, the latest one, I think it, 12 Rules for Life. I forget the title of it. But, anyhow. but the point is, he is so brilliant. I only comprehend about half of what he says. But the half that he says that I do know is it, just, uh, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. C.S. Lewis, just getting a tenth of what he says. If I can comprehend that, it's just amazing. Because, because C.S. Lewis knew what, what life was about. It's about searching him. So, searching for him. Wise men still serve him. Wise men still worship him. And my prayer for our church, my prayer for my friends is that we will be a people, a congregation of wise men and women still seeking and serving and, and worshiping Him. Thank you for being here today. Let's stand, please. Father, thank You, Lord. Thank You. Thank You for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for being a God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chance. You, you give us chance after chance after chance. You're so patient with us. I pray that you would bless each and every person that is here today. Give them that peace that comes only from you. And for the help you give them all, I will be grateful. For this I pray in the name of that, that son who came as a baby boy 2,000 years ago. In the name of Jesus. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of His Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you folks. Go in peace. Have a great, great week.